Uh, I'm going to be uh, welcoming you tonight and just setting the stage so that my colleagues here can take over. Um, Laura, uh, how about you go ahead and introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura Ackerman. I am the Disability Services Coordinator for Ohio Agribility, uh, OSU Extension, and the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at Ohio State. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Thanks, Laura. Jen? Good evening. My name is Jennifer Anden. I am currently the program manager of the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. Uh, prior to that, I was with the Pesticide Safety Education Program for four years at OSU. And before that, I was in research in turfgrass entomology with Dr. Dave Shetland for about 13 years. Thanks, Jen. And Pam? Hi, I'm Pam Bennett. I am an associate professor for Ohio State University Extension, and I'm the director of the State Master Gardener Volunteer Program and currently the interim Chadwick Arboretum Program Director. Excellent. Great. So just an overview of what we're going to do tonight. Um, go ahead to the next slide. This is part three of the five-part series. The other two sessions uh, planning and planting your vegetable garden are available online on uh, YouTube. I'll be happy to share that link with you if you haven't checked out those programs. They were awesome. Um, again, use the chat to engage with folks, but use the Q&A to send questions to any of the presenters. We'll try to toggle back and forth to Q&A and, and answer questions as they arise, but um, but we may have to wait until the end. It, it all depends on how things flow. Um, I'll close with a request that you fill out a survey after tonight's session to evaluate your experience. And, um, and then I'll be following up with emails to remind you that on July the 20th, that's also a Tuesday, we have part four of the series uh, addressing canning and preservation. And then uh, later on in the season, I think it's in August, we have uh, cleaning up and preparing for next year. So we hope that you will uh, enjoy tonight and also join us again for the next two parts of the series. Last slide that I'm going to address is the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. So this, this uh, project is a collaboration between the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the College of Food, Ag and Environmental Sciences and um, OSU Extension, which is a part of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. And we exist to create um, a college, a university, an environment that's inclusive and supportive for all who learn, work, and teach in our college. So thanks again for joining us tonight, um, and I hope you have a good time. Pass it off to Laura. Thank you. So Ohio Agribility is one of my main jobs here at Ohio State, and our mission is to promote success in agriculture for Ohio's farmers and farm families who are coping with disability or a long-term health condition. Ohio Agribility provides education and resources to farmers, agricultural businesses and groups, healthcare, education and disability professionals and anyone who's interested in making farming and gardening safe and accessible. With a lot of information at our website, that's agrability.osu.edu. It's spelled A-G-R-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot O-S-U dot E-D-U. Hi, uh, once again, I'm Pam Bennett with the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And just a little bit about this program. We work with people in our communities around Ohio and train them in horticulture programming, a wide variety of content. And in return for their training, they are required to do 50 hours of volunteer service for our counties. These volunteers have a, a wide variety of projects, including community gardens, demonstration gardens, fairs, uh, farmers markets, with our mission being to teach people sound horticultural practices. Next, Jen. So here you can see several of our volunteer activities. Um, the bottom left, we have a bunch of Master Gardener volunteers at one of the events uh, called a Garden Jubilee. In the middle, they are learning at a diagnostic workshop. 
And the bottom right was one of our state conference pictures. This is an ongoing volunteer program. If volunteers want to stay involved and engage in the program, they would do an additional 20 to 25 hours in their county of community service, as well as learn about gardening in terms of getting their 10 continuing education credits, which are required to stay with the program. If you are interested in becoming a Master Gardener volunteer, check with your local county extension office and they can tell you a little bit more about the training. So we're gonna start off tonight uh, by going over some of the accessibility factors and some of the things I want you to think about before you start gardening. So today I'm in central Ohio. It is a beautiful day. This could not have been any nicer. It's just sunny enough. The weather's really nice. We can all hope that it will stay like this all summer, but we know better. We had some hot weather a week or two ago and we're gonna have some more. So think about when you're working, we need you to think about modifying your work practices and activities. So gardening is great. It's great exercise. It's a great stress relief. It's healthy, but it's really easy to overdo it. Just one more row, one more bucket of weeds, another pot of flowers. Be very aware of your environmental factors. Is the sun out? Do you have sunscreen on? Are you wearing a sun hat and sunglasses like I have in the picture? Um, are you drinking enough water? Is the grass wet? It's really easy to slip and fall on the grass or slip on slippery wet steps. So be conscious of all those things. Another environmental factor is the noise. Um, gardening can be very peaceful, but it can also be the neighbors running the leaf blower or a couple people are weed whacking or running the lawn mowers. So all of those things, every single separate noise that you could hear adds up. They're not individual, they layer on top of one another, which is why I have a picture of some big puffy headphones on there. So you should be wearing hearing protection, especially if you are running machinery, but if others around you are wearing machinery. And if you happen to be a farmer or work on a farm and you're working in the garden, there's a lot of noise that also happens on the farm. So keep in mind hearing protection, um, and again, the sun hat and the sunscreen. I can't stress enough, it's never too late to start protecting your skin, protecting your hearing and your vision. Also be aware that medications, whether they're over the counter or prescription, those can cause sensitivity to sun, to heat. Um, some plants might make you allergic. My, a lot of people are allergic to poison ivy. I have a sensitivity to geraniums, just whatever. It makes me break out in a rash. So if I happen to come around some, I start to prickle and I know that they're there, but I don't always, recognize it in time, but some medications that you're on. So just be, be conscious that it might make you get dehydrated easier. You might get a rash from the sun. You might overheat. If you have maybe diabetes or another condition, you could have numbness or neuropathy to where if you cut yourself or stepped on something, you wouldn't know about it. So be very conscious of those things. Again, I'll stress that fatigue, heat, stress, and dehydration are things that can come with the sun, come with the heat that we're gonna have coming up this summer. So please be careful and think about all those things. Next slide, please. So safety first, we want you to, we wanna prevent slips, trips, and falls. I mentioned before being aware of your environment. Um, I tend to, once it gets warmer and it's not raining so much, I go out first thing in the morning as soon as I walk the dog, I go out and I spend 30 or 40 minutes watering my garden and the grass is really wet. There's still dew on it. So I have to be careful that I don't slip and fall on the wet grass or coming outside, walking down the porch steps because they're wet. So be conscious of those things, what's around you. You want to wear the right shoes. Not only do you want to wear something that's comfortable, something that's Ideal, I wear sandals. If the snow's not on the ground, I'm wearing sandals and it is easy to step out of a flip-flop or a sandal that doesn't have an ankle strap and make sure that you have good tread on your shoes. Um, good tread not only helps it supported, but it can give you a better grip on the wet grass. If you're climbing on and off of machinery, like I have a picture here in the lower left of my boss's daughter, uh, Cheyenne, she is showing us the right way to get on the lawnmower. She's got her left hand on the on the steering wheel, right hand on the back of the seat, and her foot is up on the footrest or the 
you know, footrest. She'll step through there across the across the between the steering wheel and the seat and then sit down. And as she's crossing in, she's going to keep her hand on the steering wheel the whole time. But don't try to get on with your arms full. Don't try to get off with your hands and arms full. It's really easy to slip. Try to have at least two points of contact, if not three at all times. And again, keep your hands free. And I have a picture over here of an apron, a great apron that has a lot of pockets. It's got all kinds of tools, spray bottles. That's a nice way to put on your apron, put all your tools in and go out to the garden. So you're not carrying big buckets of things. Everything's right there when you need it. And it keeps your hands free to keep your hand on the railing or on the fence or wherever you are. Next slide, please. Always got to talk about lifting. It's time to go out and pick up big bags of mulch and heavy flats of plants and all sorts of other things. When you are lifting, bend with your legs, not with your back. Lift with your legs, not with your back. You hear that all the time, but it starts off with a wide stance. So your feet should be about shoulder width apart. And it doesn't matter how heavy what you're lifting is. It doesn't have to be a 50 pound bag of mulch. It can be a really, really lightweight object that you're lifting. And if you lift it wrong, it's easy to throw your back out. So you wanna start with a wide stance with feet shoulder width apart, and your head in a neutral position, which just means it's not leaning too far forward and not leaning too far back. It's just over your shoulders. It's comfortable to where you would normally rest. You wanna keep the object close and in line with your nose and toes. You don't ever wanna twist when you're lifting. So keep the object close to your body. So you wide stance, you're gonna bend down at your legs. So if you can crouch down, you're gonna crouch down or do a squat, pick up the object, hold it close to you. Don't hold it way out in front of you. Hold it up close to you and kind of pick it up and you can run it up the front of your legs and hold it up against your stomach or your torso. As you're picking it up, breathe out. So kind of not really hold your breath as you're, as you're exerting the lift, but breathe in a little bit and kind of hold it as you're lifting and then breathe out as you're standing up with the, that, that keeps your back stable. And again, use the strongest part of your body, use your legs. Don't use your back alone to lift this. You could hurt yourself. Next, please. So water, it's time to start watering. I know we've had a lot of rain. We're supposed to get rain tomorrow. Water is essential and it's very heavy. I think a what a gallon of water is five pounds or eight pounds, but that's just one gallon of water. If you can, I hope that you have a, a spigot nearby so that you just need to have a hose and not necessarily carry pots or pitchers of water or buckets. But if you can plant your garden or if you have planted your garden near a water source, that's good, or have a way to get the water to the garden. A couple uh, pictures up here that I like, the one on the far left is a brass colored spigot and it's got a lever handle instead of that round wheel handle that you have to grab and twist. The lever is much easier for everybody, whether you have arthritis in your hands or not. You could hit that lever with your elbow, with the side of your hand, with your forearm, with your wrist and move it on and off. So that's something if you can upgrade your lever to that, I would. It's um, I have a list of tools on the AgriBuildy website and I think Leo will probably send that out to you also. It's a list of uh, different tools that I suggest. I don't endorse any of them. I don't get anything for putting them on my handout. It's just a nice thing that you can refer back to when you're trying to remember what I said during this. The picture in the center is a hose. It's a collapsible hose. I would almost, I call them bungee hoses, but they're super lightweight and they're, I mean, you can put, I carry three or four at a time over my shoulders and they're extremely lightweight. You hook them onto the spigot and fill them with water and they act just like a regular hose. They're very strong, but the nice thing about them is instead of having to haul a great big heavy rubber hose around, you use one of those little bungee hoses and then just spray it out until it's empty and it collapses again. And on the center picture and on the far right picture, I have the, uh, the spray nozzles. And I really like if you can tell on the one on the far right, the yellow and gray one, at the bottom, it has a little loop. So at the bottom where the handle comes down, it has a little loop. That's so that you can set it in an open position. So you can twist the, the um, nozzle to whether it's jet or spray or shower, mist, whatever you like for your plants. But the nice thing about that is you can lock that into position and you don't have to grip it and squeeze it. 
I spend probably 30 or 40 minutes a morning watering my plants. And if I had to squeeze and grip it for that long, that my hands would be really, really tired the rest of the day. So I really like those ones that you can lock open. Some of them have a loop like that. And then there's other ones that have another mechanism for locking them in place, but those things are great. Next, please. Protecting your hands, fingers, and wrists. I have two pictures up here of a good and a bad, good and poor hand position. The top one is what we call the neutral hand position. It's the way if you're just sitting in your chair or at a table right now, the way your hand would just naturally sit at the side. Your thumb is facing the ceiling. Um, the back of your hand is facing out away from your body. Your palm is facing in, it's not turned. It's just a comfortable way. And there's a little bit of a bend right there at the wrist where your hand meets your arm. That's a neutral position and that's what we like. It keeps you, if you can use your tools in that way and you see a diagram of a tool that is shaped different than your, than your typical tool. It has the trowel coming off of it, but instead of the, the handle coming off of the trowel, like in the lower picture, you've got one where it goes upright and you can just grip it like I would call it a, um, like a joystick if you ever play games, but that keeps you, it still gives you the, the, you're able to still dig with it, but you're not twisting your arm around or hand around. The poor position of the bottom shows your hand with your, with your typical traditional garden trowel, and you have to torque your wrist down so that your forearm and your thumbs form a straight line. It's poor because it can cause stretch, tenion, stretch tendons on your upper wrist, compressed tissues on the lower wrist, and calluses on the palm. So if you have the option to go and buy some garden tools that are ergonomic, that's a good choice right there is to get one where you keeps your hand in a neutral position and not in that stretched out poor position. Additionally, to save stress on your fingers, you want to re avoid repetitive use of your fingers, whether it's you're squeezing that hose nozzle squeezing a trigger spray, like misting with a water bottle. If you are pruning or doing some really fine, fine pruning and snipping, that can wear your hands out. I know it's necessary to do those things, but switch hands or switch tasks. Do that for a little while till your hand gets tired, go do something else and then come back to that. I just talked about the neutral hand position and I have up there grippy gloves. Um, those are gloves like the garden gloves that have the palm that's textured and it gives you uh, some um, friction on your palm so you don't have to hold so tight. There are also gloves that you can buy that have a strap that connects to the back of your hand at the wrist. You put the tool in your hand, it has the textured palm, you make a fist around it but not a tight fist, just hold enough to hold it in place. You would take the, the um, fabric strap that has Velcro on it, wrap it around your hand and then secure it on the inside of your wrist. Now this is kind of hard to describe, but it's, it just is a way kind of a, I don't know, it's a way to secure the tool in place so that you're not having to exert as much pressure holding it. Um, also looking for tools with spring action design or ratchet tools that can really, they do all the work. So if you had loppers or pruners, if you had a spring action or a ratchet when they would do all the hard work of the bite of that lopper or that pruner and you wouldn't be exerting as much force with your hands. So that would might be really, really worth an investment. Next, please. Here are some ergonomic tools here designed to keep the body in a neutral position, which we just talked about. On my right side, I have four picture, on the right hand side of the slide, four tools with green handles. Um, and you can see that the handle covers the tool handle curves down so that you could hold them in that neutral position, but you'd still get a good grip on them and be able to work with them. On the left-hand side, you can see the yellow and green tools. There's three tools, and then there's a cuff with a, with a pole sticking out of it. And that pole goes into the back of the tools at the bottom of that green and yellow. There's a little hole, the pole fits in there, and that gives you the stiffness in your arm. You don't have to hold your arm. Arm is steady. The pole and the cuff do that for you. So ergonomic tools have large soft handles, depression or ridge on top of the tool again, so you can put your thumb there. Curve to fit the natural contour of the hand and you want it to have something where your wrist can stay in a neutral position with the thumb on top. And um, here, I live in New Albany, so I love Oakland Nursery. They have a great tool selection. So I would go to your local nursery and look and just try out the tools because it's one thing to see them online, 
but it's completely different to go and hold it in your hand and really see what it feels like and if you could work with that and if the handle will work for you. Next, please. Also, we wanna look at long handled tools. If you have trouble um, nailing down or bending, long handled tool can let you work while you're standing or sitting, whether you're sitting in a chair and a garden seat, rolling work seat or a wheelchair or a mobility device, you can still sit and work with the long handled tools. They can provide more leverage and then you can do a two handed grip. In the next slide, I have a picture of a grip that distributes the workload to larger muscle groups. And you can have, you can also add on ergonomic handles. So if you already have some long handled tools that you like, you can add tools, add handles to those. Next slide, please. So I'd mentioned the slide here on the right hand side, you can see the red handle. It was $10. I think I checked the prices on all the tools on the tool handout um, when we did our first webinar in March. So that tool handle like right there, it looks like what would be on the top, like on the end of say a snow shovel. But this one you can attach to, to different tools. So I have here pictures of someone raking where they're just holding it in the traditional, they have their hand in that poor, poor non-neutral position where the arm is straight down. They have to lean forward really far. Whereas if they have in the second, and you can see the, the spine is curving and over time that can cause pain at the minimum could cause injury, long-term injury. Um, and the next one, they're using a tool, a handle very much like the one pictured there. It allows them to stand up straighter and you could put two of those tools on that rake handle. So you have one in the right hand and one in the left hand. And it keeps allows you to keep your hand in a more neutral position where you're just gripping that instead of torquing your hand straight to hold the rake. So if you bought a pair of those handles, you can technically switch them from tool to tool, but I would imagine after a while, the screw would probably start to strip out and they wouldn't tighten because you do have to tighten them on the tool. So they might be a good investment if there's some long handled tools you use a lot. Next, please. And my last slide here, we're gonna talk some tonight about weeds, but there are some good weeding tools that I've heard and I've read good reviews and people seem to like these. Um, long, -handled, long handled weeders that have prongs that go in and can twist and grab the, the, the weed out. They are long handled again, so you don't have to get down quite as close to them. Um, the Skidger ergonomic garden weed removal tool up in the left, it's kind of a curved shape and then you can't really tell from the picture, but it goes around and makes a point in the front. I think it has a serrated edge so you can tear stuff out between sidewalks or dig stuff up really good. There's grandpa's weeder weed remover and it has prongs and then it has um, prongs that go straight down and then prongs that come out that I believe you step on to help pull it up. And then the Wallency weed puller, which is similar to grandpa's that has the prongs on it and the little footrest. So I think that's my last one. So thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I am going to start talking about integrated pest management. And there are, depending on who you speak to, there are many, many different definitions of IPM. So I have listed here the EPA's definition. I won't read it to you. Um, but essentially, IPM or integrated pest management utilizes all of the tools in your toolbox to mitigate a pest. IPM does not mean without pesticides. It means judicious use of pesticides when all else fails. Also note that it does not say to eliminate a pest, which is, which is oftentimes not feasible or even necessary. So again, the mission of IPM is to reduce pep, pest populations to minimize damage to your garden or crop um, in an economically feasible manner and with people, property, and the environment in mind. So pictorially, this is what it would look like. So you have your cultural control using resistance, rotation, and sanitation, and traps. Biological control uh, using parasitoids, predators, et cetera. And then of course you have chemical controls and that includes synthetics as well as botanicals, organics, and desiccants. So the very first step in ITM, regardless of whether you're using this in an agronomic setting or in your garden, um, or even if your house, in your house, if you have, you know, ants or something like that in your house and you want to use IPM, the very first step is to properly identify the pest. 
know that know that pest. Additionally, you need to know the plant. Okay, so if you can know the plant, you know the pest, and if you know what time of year it is roughly, typically you can use those three things to kind of investigate and um, figure out what you're dealing with. So again, you're striving to reduce the pest to tolerable levels, not eliminating uh, that pest because 100% elimination is not typically feasible or even necessary unless you're dealing with um, something along the lines of mosquitoes or something else that is a public health concern. So again, after you've ID'd the pest and know the host plant, what are the best options for your specific situation? That is the end question. Okay, and of course, don't be afraid to get help with identification. Okay, you don't have to go in alone on this or make an educated guess as to what you're dealing with. So the Ohio State University has the C. Wayne Ellett Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic uh, where you can submit um, diverse kinds of samples, including um, insect pests or various plant tissues with um, diseases. Um, so some useful tools that I would recommend that you bring with you out to the garden um, in case you do need to get a specimen for identification purposes would be a um, 10 times hand magnification, little magnifying glass or hand lens. I would um, recommend bring a small camera or your phone with you so you can just snap some small pictures. You can always go back and refer to those pictures and enlarge them later on a computer if you want to get a better look. Um, I also recommend bringing some envelopes or Ziploc baggies with you or even baby food jars or old pill bottles with lids if you want to, um, again, collect a sample and keep that for a later date. Um, so again, just having the storage items with you, even if they're small, can be very, very beneficial if you come across an insect or some leaf tissue with some pustules or some sort of um, symptoms that you need to get diagnosed. So if you do think that you're going to be sending off any samples to a clinic, you may want to either refrigerate or freeze those samples. So please make sure you're following online clinic guidelines for preparing and shipping that specimen. And I have included the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic um, URL here. And um, there, there's a, a website there where you can submit your samples and it has really great instructions on how to do so. I will turn it over to Pam. Okay. So, you know, IPM, if we could say, hey, pull out this bottle of IPM and spray it on, that would be fantastic. It would be so easy to do. But IPM requires a little bit of work. But the great thing about the work is once you learn about a specific pest and once you learn about the problems that they cause, you'll know what to do then in the future whenever you have that particular crop. So here are a few of the things, and I'll talk just about a couple of them, but here are some of the things that you can do um, in terms of IPM practices. One of them is tolerate some damage. So there are some plants that if there's an insect on it, I will tolerate it because it's not that big of a deal. Take tobacco hornworm, for instance, on tomatoes. Those are those great big green hornworms. If I find one or two on there chewing leaves, I'll just hand pick and I'll give it to the kids to squash because I don't like to squash them, but I'll just hand pick and eliminate it that way. Um, now, if there are 10 of them on there, I'm probably not gonna tolerate that damage, so I would take action. So there are just some things that they can take a little bit of damage and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but then there are other things that you know you have to know what that threshold is as to when to take action. The other thing you can do is use resistant host plants. If you grow roses, you're probably very familiar with the disease black spot on roses. So we look for those roses that are black spot resi resistant. Well, in the tomato world, there's this terminology called V, F, and N that you'll find on tags. That means they're resistant to verticillium, V, fusarium wilt, F, and nematodes. So if you have problems with these particular pests, you can use those resistant varieties and hopefully prevent any problem from happening. Another thing that's really important in my opinion is to uh, fall garden cleanup. Get rid of anything that you have laying around in the garden, all the debris that you have laying around. Many times that provides the inoculant or the hiding place for next year's pest problems. So clean up your vegetable garden as best you can, put everything in the compost, and then next spring, hopefully you will have minimal problems with insect and disease uh, issues. Um, one final thing on cultural practices, 
I truly believe in making sure that you don't let weeds go to seed. It's one of my mantras in all the pro projects we're involved in with Master Gardener volunteers. If a plant is going to seed and it's a weed, you wanna get it before it goes to seed. So when you see that bloom, yank that out of there. I and mean, it's very hard to get all the weeds out of your garden. I certainly can't do it myself, but if I see something getting ready to bloom, I'll get that out first because once it goes to seed, it just gives me more, more weeds for next year. So I'll really try to get rid of that before I allow it to go to seed. Next, Jen. All right, so let's talk about some IPM biological practices. So, oops, sorry about that, I bumped the cord, I think, I apologize. So in terms of your natural enemies, you have predators such as spiders, ladybugs, and other beetles, uh, parasitoids, which are usually tiny wasps included for conids which are typically very host specific. Um, for example, there is a little tiny stelionid wasp that will lay her eggs only inside of hairy chinch bug eggs. And so um, usually it's a very host specific relationship with that particular parasitoid. And then we also have pathogens such as bacteria, fungi, and entomopathogenic nematodes that um, are also um, really great at killing insects. So natural enemies need habitats such as wildflowers, um, wildflower borders, hedges, or other perennial sites to protect them during the winter. Mulch can provide a great harborage for spiders and other predators. Um, you might also consider ground cover, which will one, improve soil fertility, um, but also provide shelter for a wide variety of those natural enemies. So for your food sources, um, most predators and parasitoids will still need a source of pollen and nectar in addition to their prey. So they're not necessarily only after that protein. Um, so we recommend planting flowers that are small and relatively open, such as asters and coreopsis, and plant flowers that bloom at different times to provide food throughout the growing season. Um, we also can use chemical control, of course. IPM does not exclude chemical control. Um, soft pesticides or minimal impact will have minimal impact on beneficials. Insecticidal soaps, which are most effective on soft bodied insects like aphids and lace bugs. Um, these are nice to utilize because there is no residue left behind on the plant once that product has dried. So it is not going to be um, typically an issue for beneficials or other pollinators. We do recommend using at dusk or dawn when pollinators are not actively foraging, just in case. Um, the active ingredient is potassium salts of fatty acids, which is not the same thing as using a dish soap um, or any of your other household items. So please keep that in mind. Um, we still do recommend using, um, you know, registered products with the EPA. Horticultural oils are another one of one of those. Um, Soft pesticides, if you will. Uh, they're basically a lightweight petroleum-based product like mineral oil. Um, they give excellent control on scale, true bugs, and caterpillars, among others. And again, as with all pesticides, please make sure you are following the pesticide label. So um, biological control in the classic sense is basically importing a natural enemy to control an invasive pest. So if you think about it, we brought over the Asiatic colored lady beetle to control aphids um, way back when, and they did control some aphids, but what, what ended up happening after that? Those Asiatic lady beetles ended up becoming a pest themselves. They got out of control, they ended up congregating all over people, people's houses, and many folks did not appreciate that. Um, the other ways you can, um, use biological practices are to conserve the natural enemies that are already present. So you have conservation. You also have augmentation, which is the additional release of predators and parasitoids. Um, basically, there are commercially available um, predators and parasitoids that you can buy from companies and then release either in your greenhouse or in your garden to hopefully combat, combat that pest. Um, it is really important to understand that predators may not be in high enough numbers to reduce damage to the garden. Um, they might not necessarily stay where you put them. So if you do release them in your garden, you know, there's no guarantee that they're going to stay there. We do recommend, though, um, whether you're using 
um, some sort of a biological control like BT or Bavaria bastiana or um, live predators and parasitoids that you are purchasing from a live manufacturer, um, uh, a reliable source rather than just finding somebody online um, who again may not have the freshest product or you know the best predator to control your pests. Um, again, using my con microbial control as um, as a control for your pest or management, I should say. Microbials are usually, again, very specific to a particular insect or group of insects. They will have a very short shelf life and cannot handle temperature extremes. So you have to be careful. You can't just, you know, store them in the garage when the, you know, it's 90 degrees outside. Um, you just have to remember that these are live organisms that we're dealing with. Um, so again, they, some of these pesticides or microbial pesticides might be susceptible to UV degradation and may require an additional surfactant during application. Um, and that may make the, uh, the timing of that application crucial. So we all know that it's important to conserve our pesticides. So resistance is a real issue and misusing or overusing pesticides may lead to resistance. So um, if you are using pesticides, it is important to rotate or tank mix when um, applicable. It's also important to know when um, in the pest life cycle, when is the most, when is, are they most vulnerable or when are they most susceptible to that toxicant? So it's also important to know a little bit about the biology or the life cycle of that pest, um, even if it's a disease. So um, again, if you have a disease cycle, it's important to understand that after an infection has occurred or once you see the signs and symptoms of a, of a fungal pathogen on say a tomato plant, it's often too late to make that fungicide application. Okay, so again, always read the pesticide label. Um, keep in mind that Ohio is a site specific state, meaning that the location that you are applying to must appear on the label. So for example, if I have um, an insecticide that I've been using in my turf grass, say for white grubs, I can't necessarily just go and use that insecticide in my garden. So those that garden, ornamental bed, et cetera, that site must appear on the product's label um, to be used legally. So again, use chemical controls, whether it be uh, synthetic, organic, or natural uses as a last resort because we need to conserve them. Target a specific pest. And again, know a little bit about the biology of that pest because that's gonna be important in the timing of your application. Okay, I will turn it over to Pam. Okay, Jen, if you wanna go ahead and pull everything up on this slide, that would be great. So the term pest is the blanket term for everything. So Jen's been talking about insects. I've mentioned a little bit about diseases. I've mentioned a little bit about weeds and rodents, anything that causes damage to your plant. Uh, it could be the kids running through the tomato patch and breaking the tomatoes, that could be a pest problem. Um, so anything that causes damage and weeds are under that umbrella and weeds are a big pest and I already mentioned the fact that, you know, get them before they bloom. If you let them bloom, you're going to have a lot of trouble. You can do it by hand removal. So annual weeds, like you see here on the left, this is purslane. An annual weed, as it starts to germinate, you can use like the hoe that um, Laura showed earlier, the triangle hoe, the scuffle hoe. You can use any kind of hose just to kind of rake them up get underneath, take out all the, the roots, and they'll dry up in the heat of the day. So that's really good for annual weeds. Perennial weeds, however, that you see on the right are a problem. Uh, the one with the orange wheelbarrow there, that's a dandelion. And you can see that really thick taproot that this dandelion has. The problem is, if you pull the tops off, you still have all that root underground that's going to start taking off and growing again. So until you eliminate that entire root, you're going to have a problem with dandelions. Now, the biggest thing for me is try to get rid of any perennial weeds before you even start the garden. So take a year or two if you have to and get rid of everything that's there, dig them up, use herbicides if you like to use herbicides, um, use raised beds if you have weeds and you don't you know, have the capacity or the resources to eliminate all the weeds, use a raised bed or a container garden. But if you have a dandelion and you're gonna be planting in there, you're gonna have dandelions for a while. And again, don't let those things go to seed because then you'll have many, many, many more. Perennial grasses as the one in the middle. 
same thing. They have long root systems. They grow with underground rhizomes. And if you don't get rid of them before planting, you're going to be dealing with them for a long time. So it's a good idea to get rid of these weeds prior to planting a new garden. Now, once you plant the garden, you could use a herbicide such as preen. Preen has the active ingredient called trifluralin, and it will prevent weeds from growing. However, it will not kill the weeds that are there. So when you read the label, as Jen mentioned, always read the label, you have to have a clean weed-free bed before you put this down. Second, you have to have a good irrigation or good rain to water that in and soak that into the soil to create that weed barrier. Third, you can't go in and start raking and hoeing and moving that soil or you disturb that barrier that you just developed. So you have to read the label. It tells you all that information on the label. In addition, there are some vegetables that you can plant and use preen right, right away. Some of them are wait, you wait until six weeks post planting. You wait until they're established before you use it. Again, that is clearly stated on the label. Glyphosate is the product that you'll find in things like Roundup or Kills All, something that kills everything. It's a herbicide that is, is contact, kills anything it comes in contact with that's green. It will work on your dandelions and your ornament or your uh, perennial grasses. However, you really wanna be very, very careful not to use it in the garden during the growing season. You can get herbicide drift, you can get volatilization, you can get all kinds of different damage on your plants because our vegetables, especially tomatoes, are very sensitive to herbicide drift. Um, one of the things to get rid of dandelions is kind of like multi-pronged pull it, let it grow again, pull it again, let it grow again until you starve it completely of all the root system there, or spray it, let it grow back, spray it, let it grow back. In other words, it's not gonna be a one time and it dies completely. So when you get those perennial weeds with those thick tap roots, thistles, dandelions, it's gonna take some time to get rid of them. But if I haven't said it enough, I'm gonna say it one more time, don't let them go to seed. You see all those seeds out there and they're just gonna cause more problems for your, your gardens in the future. Next, Jen. Here's the preen label. And you can see I've kind of outlined some things here. Bros broccoli, Brussels sprouts, that list, you can use preen before seeding and it's safe. After seeding or transplanting cantaloupes, cucumbers, you see you have to apply after five leaves or more. Potatoes after planting, before transplanting, celery, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and perennial vegetables such as asparagus apply prior to spear emergence. So you really need to read that label so you know when you can apply it. And again, this is a garden weed preventer, so the soil has to be clean and weed free before you can use this. This will not work on perennial weeds. Dandelions will come right up through it, thistle come right up through it, bindweed, all those perennial weeds. We'll just come right up through it. So it's specifically for those annual weeds like your winter annuals and your summer annuals. Next. Another option for weed control is mulching. A lot of people like to use mulches. Mulch basically is anything that covers the ground. In a garden, you know, vegetable garden, it doesn't have to look as pretty like you might want in the front flower bed where you have, you know, hardwood mulch and it's all pretty. Um, it can be anything, any of these items I use grass clippings, although I wait until the dandelions have finished blooming, gone to seed before I start using grass clippings because if I put grass clippings that have dandelion seeds in them, it just goes right back into the garden and causes more trouble. So I will use grass clippings. I also use straw and you can put newspaper or cardboard down between the rows to help with weed control, but I don't recommend newspaper and cardboard underneath the plants because that does prevent oxygen, uh, oxygen exchange and also prevents water from getting down into the root system and saturating it. So I'll just use the newspaper and cardboard in the rows. I really don't like this black landscape fabric that you see here in the middle. Um, you know, if you have it in long enough, you'll eventually have weeds growing in and on top of it simply because if birds drop the weeds and there's moisture, those weeds are gonna germinate right through that fabric. Uh, and if you plant your garden every year, you kind of got to pull it up and lay it back now. Same thing with black plastic. Now, there are commercial growers who will use black plastic and they'll plant in the black plastic, but they use that because the black plastic heats the soil up faster in the spring and they can get an earlier crop to the market as opposed to waiting a little bit later in the season. Next. Jen, are you doing this one or is this me? 
I think this is me. Sorry. I think that's still you. Sorry. Yes, it's still me. Um, so with pest management, Jen gave you kind of the, the basics of IPM and what to look for. First of all, identify the pests. I used to work in a garden center and people would come in and say, I've got something eating my tomatoes. What do I spray? Or I've got something eating my, my peppers. What do I spray? I won't make any recommendation until we know exactly what's eating your peppers or exactly what's eating your tomatoes. What if it's a pest that the life cycle is such that it's already done feeding and you bring me in a leaf and there's already damage on it, but it's not, it's the life cycle's over for the year. Why would you want to spray then? So you want to identify the pest and the plant, know exactly about that pest, know that life cycle, and then target your controls to that life cycle. A good example, many of you may be familiar with Japanese beetles. So Japanese beetles get on a lot of different things, green beans, uh, roses and so forth. And Japanese beetles right now are underground as pupil cases. They will eventually emerge as adults sometimes toward the end of June, somewhere around there. And they'll start feeding on all the above ground plants that they like. So if you have green beans and you have some of these other plants, they're gonna be feeding on that. So that would be the time to target the adults. Um, if you don't have those plants that they like, then don't bother spraying for Japanese beetles until you know if we're gonna have a pest population. The other thing about Japanese beetles, their populations come and go. Sometimes they're really high, sometimes they're really low. So in many cases, it's kind of wait and be inspecting on a regular basis to catch something before it builds up. The squash vine borer that you see down here on the bottom, the bottom left is the actual uh, larval uh, stage of the vine borer. And on the right hand side, you see this brown mark um, that's right, uh, right around here. That brown mark, that's the frass where that borer has actually bored into that stem. So she will be laying her eggs sometime in mid to the end of June in the squash plants. That's the time that you wanna have controls at the base of your plant to prevent her from laying eggs. Once they get into the stem like this, it's very difficult to get rid of them because they're protected by the stem. Plus you can go in maybe and, and, and cut them out and recover the squash plant, but it's not always a surefire thing. So again, target your controls, know the life cycle and identify that pest first and foremost. Next. Whoops, back one to fencing, Jen. So let's talk a minute about rodents. So depending on where you live, you may or may not have rodent problems. And depending on where you live, it, it could vary. You could live in the city and maybe have deer problems. You might have squirrels. Fortunately, where we live right now, I don't have a lot of squirrels, but I do have chipmunks and we have a horrendous uh, raccoon, groundhog and deer population. So I've decided I'm not gonna grow sweet corn because the raccoons love sweet corn and I don't wanna put up a fence and I don't wanna deal with them. So I just won't grow sweet corn. I can buy it just as cheap as trying to grow it. Uh, but I also have a, a pretty heavy rabbit population right now. And if I wanna grow green beans and edamame and my cabbage and cauliflower, I need to put a fence up. So when it comes to rodents, exclusion, keeping them out of an area or fencing is your ultimate surefire way of getting rid of them. Um, unfortunately with deer, that requires a 10 foot fence because deer can jump as high as uh, six to eight feet. So there are several different options for deer. Uh, if you live in West Virginia, you, you don't have a vegetable garden unless you've got a 10 foot fence up and around it. So that's the surefire way to get rid of them. Same thing with rabbits, my three foot chicken wire fence just around those particular plants in that area will keep the rabbits out of the garden. Um, there are sprays, there are powders, there are dust, there are things like dried blood that will work for a short period of time. But once the animal or rodent gets used to it or it rains and washes it away, it's not gonna phase that animal at all. Uh, the biggest thing with deer is don't let them establish a path and let them find out that you have something really good for them. If they find that, they're going to be there constantly because they know there's some goodies in that garden. So try to discourage them from the get-go. Don't let them set up shop or otherwise you will be fighting with them uh, and we'll have to end up doing a 10-foot type of fence to prevent them. But exclusion is your, your surefire way of doing it. But don't hesitate. There are other things. You know, you can try the... Um, what is it? Irish spring soap, people say. But again, once the animals realize it's not going to cause them harm, it doesn't bother them. They'll come right on up to the area. So uh, rodents are indeed under that pest management category, and that's something you want to look for as well. Okay. 
Leo, back to you for Q&A. Great, thank you, uh, Pamela, Jennifer, and Laura. Uh, Nadine asked, what do you do about those chipmunks? I think you just answered that. Uh, yeah, and, and chipmunks, the other thing, and this may sound inhumane, but you can catch chipmunks with mouse traps or rat traps. Um, a bait that they like, peanuts or some kind of bait, you can catch chipmunks with um, bait because they really, they're, they're cunning little things and they will dig in pots and they will dig in your plants. They don't eat the plants, but they just kind of dig around in the ground and then they, they uproot them. Uh, but you can use um, traps to catch chipmunks. I'm a fan of live traps myself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then relocating. Yep. Other questions? We have a few more minutes. We are starting to see um, flea beetles right now. Flea beetles cause little teeny tiny holes in the leaves. They're all over my broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage. Um, they're just, they're little teeny tiny black beetles that just feed and, and create little holes in the leaves. Um, they will cause the plant to kind of decline in terms of the actual growth. So that's something that we're seeing right now. Uh, it's early June. Pretty soon here, we'll be seeing squash vine borer adults laying their eggs. So keep an eye out for them. Um, and knowing, again, knowing your plants and what, what kind of pests that you deal with will give you a really good idea on, in terms of what time to start looking for that particular problem. That reminds me, there's a file that I want to share that it's called the Tabletop Vegetable Pests. So I just shared um, a document. It's a one pager, Common Pests in Ohio Home Vegetables. So doing a little homework in advance, knowing what pests are likely to appear in your garden, given what you have planted, can uh, help expedite the process of identifying the pest and identifying strategies to manage it. So nobody has any pest problems yet in their vegetable garden, huh? Um, I did, I had some caterpillars eating my mesclun mix. Um, and then I have, I have little red mites that I haven't been able to determine if they're feeding on the lettuce or if they're predatory. I think they might be feeding on the lettuce, but it's not that big of a deal. They're those little bright red mites. They, the, I think those uh, are clover mites. Clover mites, yeah. Those are common this time of year. You typically see them running around on concrete on a hot, sunny day. Yeah. I see them on my one pot on a hot, sunny day. A brown pot. Yeah, and notice Leo said it's not really a big deal. You know, sometimes you find an errant insect, like for instance, everybody knows cicadas are out right now. At least those of us in Southwest and Western Ohio, we're, you know, seeing them everywhere. Just because they show up on a plant doesn't mean they're actually doing something. You know, I ha I've had several people send me pictures of cicadas on perennials. Well, the adult cicadas don't feed on plants. They lay their eggs in the stems of plants. They feed on the roots of plants as a nymph. So those, just because you see a bug or an insect does not mean you need to take control. So that's a really good point, Leo, that it doesn't really bother you. It's not doing anything, you know. No, I see, I've seen a couple on the leaves and I've, They've been stationary, so I've wondered if they were feeding, but then I look at the condition of the leaves and maybe there's a few spots. I did some research online and it says it'll leave dark spots on the leaves. It's not, you know, they're all over the pot and only a mm -hmm. few on the leaves. So I'm mm -hmm. not gonna freak out and right. apply right. seven to uh, a food item. Exactly. exactly. And yeah, I appreciate the emphasis on, you know, tolerating damage. Um, because the food is gonna taste just fine if it has a little mark on it. Um, and that, yeah, we don't need to whip out chemicals and, and do all sorts of things just because we find 
a caterpillar. So what I did when I started seeing caterpillar damage is I looked for the caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, it was challenging to find it because it blended in so well. But once mm -hmm. I found um, one, I, I put it out for my birds to eat. Uh, and then I found a, a chrysalis or a cocoon of another one, and I haven't found any other since. So that, you know, if you have a small garden, doing hand maintenance like that is possible, especially if the pests are large and easy to, right. easy to see. And Laura, I just want to let you know, I've worked in the garden for the last two solid weeks, and I think of you every time I'm stretching or turning or in pain, I'm thinking, okay, now Laura would not like me to do it this way. So you are, you are on my mind and I am learning from you. I am very glad that I'm making a difference. I was like, you yeah. are, you are for me. And every time I, when I walked out yesterday, cause we pretty much are going out the garage door, just hold over from the winter. When I go out the front door and I think, oh my gosh, I hope nobody who knows me can see my garden. I think of you and I'd be really embarrassed because it is. <laughs> It has been a lazy year. I, I have perennials, but I haven't. Yeah, they look terrible. I live in a condo and part of it's just me being passive aggressive that I want them to send me a nasty letter about it so we can fight about it. But yeah, I'm, I think about you too, Pam, and I'm glad that you can't see my garden because it looks bad right now. Yeah, that's funny. It's very lush. It's abundant. Well, we haven't had the best weather for growing vegetables yet. So I expect with the next couple of weeks, if we get some warm weather, we'll start seeing a lot more stuff happening. All right, well, quiet crowd tonight. Thank you for joining. I hope you learned something and uh, you got the handouts. I sent the, the outline in email last week, the link that you use tonight is the same link that you'll use for the, the last two parts of the set series if you um, join us. I will send a reminder email out again a week before the, the next sessions. In the meantime, happy gardening. Enjoy the nice weather. Next time we talk, you'll be harvesting everything and putting it up for the winter. Thanks, Leo. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thanks all. Sorry for the noisy children.